Okay, um, so we will get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ask Me Anything with Marita Chang. Marita Chang is the founder of RoboGals, an international student-run organization which empowers young women to consider taking a STEM-related career path. She was named the 2012 Young Australian of the Year. She is also the founder and current CEO of Abbott, a startup robotic company. She also co-founded AI Poly, an app to assist blind people to recognize objects using their mobile phones. She was also named one of the world's top 50 women in technology by Forbes in 2018 and was recognized on the Forbes 30 under 30 list in 2016. Uh, Ms. Chang, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, thanks Adele. It's good to be here. And uh, let's get started with the AMA. Um, so we, uh, so why don't you um, go over your, uh, about yourself a little bit first? Sure. Um, so I'm from Australia, and when I was at university, I uh, studied mechatronics engineering and computer science because um, I thought that robots are really cool and I wanted to get involved in the robotics revolution. When I was at university, I realized that there weren't many women in my class. And this was kind of surprising to me because when I was in high school, I felt like uh, my math classes had like eight, eight women um, and 12 guys. Uh, my physics classes, they also had lots of women. And so I was just really surprised that there weren't many girls in my engineering classes. And so in my second year at university, I decided I wanted to build a robot with my friends and we started building uh, these robots together. And then I thought, well, why don't I get some funding from the university? So I went to the head of the electrical engineering department and asked him for some funding. And he said he was interested in sending some university students out to girls schools uh, around Melbourne and uh, deliver workshops with robots in order to get girls interested in engineering. And I thought, wow, I could actually make a difference to the number of girls in my class. And I thought, if we go out to one school, why don't we just go out to all the schools? And so I started making a plan for that to happen. I got 25 of my friends to sign up to say that they would help with this endeavor. Uh, three of my friends showed up for the first uh, robot building session and over the next uh, six weeks we called schools we recruited more people to join us and we designed robotics workshops uh, and in the first three months we we taught 124 girls from about five schools around Melbourne and then I uh, left Melbourne and uh, I left that organization to run without me and I went overseas to study in London for a year at Imperial College uh, studying mechanical engineering. While I was over in London, I again noticed there weren't many women in my engineering classes. There were 15 girls out of 150 in mechatronics in mechanical engineering. Uh, there were four girls out of 120 in computer science, two girls out of 17 in aerospace engineering. Uh, I noticed there was nothing like rubber gals in the UK. And I thought, well, if I want to make a difference to the young girls here, I need to be the one to do it. And uh, so I emailed the Women in Engineering and Science organization and said, hey, I want to start up this thing where we go out to schools with robots and teach girls how to build and program robots. And uh, they forwarded my email out to all the women in their network. And I um, corresponded with these women. We set up the first meeting and no one came to the first meeting. And so I cried. Um, and then I set up another meeting for the next day. And I, I guess I didn't give enough notice because no one showed up again. And so after a shorter period of time, I, I cried. And uh, then I thought, you know, I, I've, I'm in London for a year. Um, I've only got another six months here. Uh, what, what do I need to do differently in order to make people you know, show up and you know, get this thing started? And so I emailed everyone who said they were interested and said we had a really amazing first meeting, uh, but I'd really like to meet you. And so by our third meeting, we had four young women show up and that's how Forever Girls in the UK got started. While I was over in the UK, I noticed that the UK was really small and so it was really cheap to get around to the different cities. It was like 10 pounds or like 10 US dollars to go from 
London to Oxford or London to Cambridge or London to Bath or Southampton. And so it was really easy for students from one university to meet with students from another university who had the same interests. And so you kind of felt like you had friends all over the UK. And so I thought it'd be so cool if we could uh, do something similar in Australia where we meet with other young female engineering students from other universities around the UK and make friendships and um, build a larger network. And so while I was in the UK, I started emailing uh, universities around Australia and asking them if they wanted their own River Yards chapters. And um, after months of back and forth correspondence, they all said yes. And so, um, and so a month after I returned from the UK, we actually expanded to another four chapters of four universities around Australia. And so we were all over Australia. Um, we held a three day conference where we invited six young women from each of those four universities to my university. And we taught them all about setting up their own chapters and uh, then sent them back to their own universities, uh, their own hometowns in order to run their own chapters. And that was so successful that six months later, I returned to the UK and we expanded to another five chapters in the UK. And since then, we hold our three-day conferences every year, uh, one for Asia Pacific region, one for Europe, and one for the North America region. Uh, so we're now all over the world. Uh, we have 31 chapters and we teach tens of thousands of girls our robotics workshops every year. After that, I thought, I don't want to just tell girls about all the things they can do with engineering. I want to show them. And so I um, went to Singularity University in Mountain View in California for 10 weeks. And I did a course about exponential technologies and learned about the latest in uh, nanotechnology, medicine, biology, chemistry, uh, space technology. And then we also learned about big problems in the world around food, around pollution, uh, uh, waste management, uh, around space. Um, and we had about 150 lectures over, uh, over 10 weeks. And then we were told, now that you have all this knowledge, go and impact the lives of a billion people over the next 10 years. And uh, you have two weeks to start a company, go, go and start. And so my friends and I, we thought back to all of our lectures that we saw, and we decided that something we found really interesting was the computer vision technology where, uh, where you could write a program to recognize dogs in images or, or frisbees or trees or cars. And we thought it'd be so amazing to put that technology onto a phone so that blind people could recognize objects in their everyday life and help them navigate. And so we, uh, so yeah, in, in less than 10 days, we called all the blind organizations in San Francisco and in the Bay Area, um, and we went and saw them. Uh, we made a prototype in a, in a weekend, just like you guys are doing now. Um, uh, so, so it was like Thursday, we, we, we had the idea on Wednesday, on Thursday, we started doing some initial research, um, started emailing the blind organizations, uh, Friday, we were calling them all, um, setting up time to meet with them, asking them questions over the phone. Saturday, Sunday, we built the app. Monday, we left and uh, went and met with them all in person, showed them our prototype, asked them for feedback, filmed their feedback. Um, Wednesday, we, we fixed our prototype. Um, Thursday, Friday, met with them all. Uh, it happened that on Saturday, there was a Silicon Valley blind um, organization's annual picnic. And so we went there on Saturday, um, got some media to film with us, um, tested it with all the blind people there. And um, then on uh, Saturday night, we, uh, we managed to get an interview with TechCrunch and uh, did an interview with them. And so by Monday, we had a TechCrunch article. We tested our app with over 66 blind people. Um, and uh, you know, we, we built our second prototype. And so by our demo day on Tuesday, um, we went in you know, with our 10 day startup already having um, TechCrunch and all the follow on media, um, you know, an app that people had used and given us feedback on. And uh, we got 
yeah, we, we won the, the prize for like the class favorite and the judges favorite award. Um, and it led to even more press and opportunities. And so we started a computer vision company out of that where we uh, finished a product, uh, we launched it, we, uh, and we've had, yeah, we've had ten, hundreds of thousands of blind people around the world uh, download that app and use it. Uh, and, and we've since uh, done other projects uh, in that space. Um, and right now the team is working on uh, cancer research in Europe using that computer vision technology. Um, but I, yeah, I love robots and so I, I decided to go back and work on robots. And so I created a company called Albot where we make robots to help people in their everyday lives. And we've made a telepresence robot that we've uh, taken to market and sold uh, all across uh, Australia, um, particularly for kids with cancer to go to school remotely um, and people with disabilities to go to work remotely. And uh, we've also done a lot of work in robot arms, uh, making robot arms for people with limited upper limb mobility. Now the team is working on an eight degree of freedom robot arm that's uh, on a movable platform uh, for the home. And the use case is uh, for a person with a disability, if they need something in the middle of the night, rather than calling a carer, waiting for a carer to get in their car, drive to the person's home, um, go to the fridge, for example, get a drink for them. Um, the, the person with disability doesn't need anything else. And so the carer goes home. Um, you know, all in all, an interaction like that would mean that the carer would need to take an hour and a half, two hours out of their life to, to get that person a glass of water. That person would need to wait 40 minutes to an hour to get their glass of water. Um, so, you know, it's not optimal. With our robot, it means that a person with a disability could press a button, the robot, um, a carer could log into the robot from anywhere in the world, drive that robot over to the fridge, have the robot, get that drink, uh, give it to the person with disability. Um, and that whole interaction could take 10 minutes. So it's a better user experience for the person with disability. It's a better user experience for the carer because then after that 10 minutes, they can then go and help another customer um, or they can go and spend time with their family. And so it means that um, everyone, everyone has a better experience. And this is a, a big problem um, with the growing uh, aging population. Uh, there's a big need for carers. So three of the top five growing jobs in the next 10 years are actually care related jobs. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, there's a lot of jobs available for carers. Uh, so they won't need to, um, so the robots aren't you know, taking over their jobs per se. Um, the carers can do higher value tasks around the home, like prepare meals or um, help help the person out of bed and help them help them get dressed. Uh, whereas a robot can do easier tasks, uh, like yeah, getting the drinks or um, turning pages in a book. Uh, so doing things that um, uh, that that free up the carer's time, so the, the carer can do those higher value tasks. So yeah, that's what I do. I with software, build robots, and uh, try to have fun along the way. Thank you for that. Um, really great, really great insight. Um, so we have some, we have a pre-submitted question here. So um, what opportunities would you recommend young developers to take advantage of to further enhance their technical skills? Sure. Yeah, so it's great that you're doing this hackathon. I think ha hackathons are a really great way to learn how to make technology because then you have to come up with a solution and then execute on that solution in, in a really short amount of time. And so by having that deadline, it, it forces you to actually make something and deliver on it rather than have a project linger on for a long time. I think it's also good that you're working with other people, um, working in little teams because uh, having other people to learn from and to encourage you to do your work is, is really important. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's really my advice. Uh, so everyone that I, um, that I hire, I, I look at their previous projects that they've done. Uh, I, I look at, yeah, what they do with their spare time. And I, I do tend to find that uh, those who um, really, those who are really impressive tend to be the ones that have spent their spare time 
working on side projects, um, just building things that interest them, uh, whatever that may be. So usually that's going out and finding a problem or, or just being interested in some technology and wanting to apply it in an interesting way. Um, even if it's been built before, it hasn't been built by you. So uh, yeah, just go out and find something that's interesting and create a solution to it. And every project that you do makes you better. Yep, agree with that. So now we'll be moving on to the YouTube live stream questions. So um, fellow hackers, if you guys have any questions for Ms. Chang, please drop it in the YouTube live stream chat and we will get to it one by one. So the first question is, did you ever mentor or lead a club in university? If so, any advice um, you could give to someone who has never had a leadership role or wants to pursue one? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think, when I was in um, high school, I, I always kind of thought that I wanted to be a leader, like it was something that I wanted to do, but I never really had those leadership opportunities, unfortunately. So I was never in like the student council um, and I wasn't like part of the student leaders or student captains in high school. Um, so yeah, by the time I got to university, I, I didn't actually have that much leadership experience. And I thought, well, I. I want to get that leadership experience and I want to, um, I just want to know, you know, I just want to improve and, and get better. And so that was actually a really big motivation in starting up Rubber Gals. It was to get that leadership experience and learn how to be a leader and see if I liked it. And um, so I, I think like in, in terms of being a leader, it's um, you, you just have to start at your level. Um, so start, start small. Um, and I and uh, I, I know in the early days, like it, a lot a lot of things would upset me that don't upset me now. Um, and it yeah, it took a lot of work, a trial and error. Uh, so for example, in the early days, I mean, I, I think the good thing about university and um, student clubs and uh, things like that is that um, you can kind of galvanize a lot of people to work on something with you, and 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 just test it. Um, like, you know, because they're, they're volunteers or, um, or they're students like you. And so you don't have to, um, it, it's not like a formal work situation or something. So it's kind of like a, a low risk way to, to practice your leadership skills. Um, and so I remember like when I first started Robo Girls, I was so excited about it that, you know, I had those three other girls who showed up to the first meeting. And so um, in, in the first month, I, I kind of spoke to them and said, oh, hey, what, what, what aspect of this project are you interested in? And I kind of negotiated a role for them in the project that way. Um, but then, you know, we're, we're teaching all these girls, we're trying to teach more girls. And so like the, the roles that we need needed filled just kept growing. And so the people that I recruited to join the team kept growing as well. And so I think like within two months, two and a half months, we had like 13 people in our executive committee. Um, so we had like an accounts person and we had a designer and we had like a schools manager and we had sponsorships manager. I mean, we had like 13 people and it was just especially pretty big. Um, and so after I'd gone to the UK, um, me and like my, my core team, we, we kind of took stock and we were like, you know, 13 people is a bit too much. It was, it was a bit, it was, it was kind of uninspiring because with that many people, like not everyone showed up to all of our meetings and not everyone knew what was going on. And um, it was kind of a mess. So you had like some people who were more committed and it's just not that fun if you're like in a team and people aren't committed. And so we actually said, you know, we don't need that many people. Um, you know, we don't need a full-time, we don't need like a full-time designer as a team member. We, we don't really need a accounts person yet. Let's just like cross all these people off, um, off our list. And you know, let's let's give accounts to the secretary. Um, let's uh, let's give let's have a smaller team and give them more roles. And so that's what we did, and uh, that's how we came up with our our chapter structure of six people, where uh, we said let's have a smaller team where everyone has more responsibility, and that will be more inspiring and more fun. Um, and, and and it was it was more inspiring and more fun to have a smaller group of committed people. Um, and yeah, I think I think a big part of leadership is just listening. Uh, so yeah, listening to your team members, 
uh, finding out what they have to say, finding out what their, their thoughts are, um, and, and just listening to their opinions on the next steps for your project. Um, and then even if you don't follow through on what their ideas were, at least your team members feel heard. Uh, and that's, that's important. Yeah, completely agree with you. That's uh, really, that's a really great insight you gave us. So um, there's another question here is, what inspired you to take up a project to help the blind? Was there any personal experience which inspired you to help the blind? Since you are the co-founder of AI Poly and what really motivated you to take the project? Sure. So as I said, I was at Singularity University and um, it's, it's a really cool place. It's for like there were 80 people from like 44 countries. And as I said, it was all about learn about exponential technologies to improve the lives of a billion people within the next 10 years. Um, anyway, so I remember one night, this was, a, this was actually the, the Tuesday night <laughs> before my story began. Um, uh, so we had lectures from like 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. But that Tuesday night, uh, our nightly lecture went from like 7 p.m. until the last person left. And it was a lecture about the meaning of life. Um, so it didn't actually finish until like 9 a.m. the next morning. Um, Anyway, I think it was my co-founder who was like the last to leave. <laughs> I was like, I, I'm going to sleep at like 11 p.m. Um, anyway, so, and the reason why I decided to go to sleep at 11 p.m. is because that Wednesday morning, I actually had a meeting with the with Google.org. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, be wide awake for Google.org because uh, I wanted to ask them for some, some money for my uh, projects. Um, anyway, so I was at my meeting with, at google.org and uh, my, my co-founder decided to tag along anyway with through sleep. Um, and at the end of the meeting, the person said, hey, so what are you what are you working on now? And, and so I said, oh, well, I'm at Singularity University and we have to find a project to do um, to improve the lives of a billion people in the next 10 years. And we're not really sure what to do, but we're interested in computer vision. Um, and she said, oh, I happen to have a PhD in computer vision. Uh, and I said, well, what, what are some of the problems that you've seen in this area? And she said that OCR still isn't solved, uh, getting computers to read letters uh, correctly, because sometimes car, car parking lots, for example, uh, might write letters in a different way where, um, for example, they'll write an R and they'll have like a, a line and then they'll have like the rest of the R kind of separated and so computers can get that confused. And she also said that she had a blind friend who found it really difficult to get from point A to point B. So even if he put in lots of work, preparing uh, lots of work, uh, mapping it out, uh, especially if he was going to a new place, uh, his exact route, his, uh, his taxi, um, it was just a really stressful experience and it was always very stressful if anything didn't go wrong, uh, it, didn't, it didn't go right. And uh, she said that he, uh, he would put in all this work, but still like he would, get out of the taxi, get out of the car, um, and he'd look around and he, he wouldn't actually know, you know, where he was, like, because he, he, he was blind. And so he'd, he wouldn't be able to know whether he was looking at a car park or looking at a park or looking at trees or looking at a building. Um, and it was, it was just really stressful. Um, and so, like, thinking, thinking of that uh, scenario, um, yeah, I told my co-founder and, and we said, why don't we, yeah, put that computer vision technology on a phone and um and uh we we actually uh, I, something that's really cool about ipol is that it runs in real time so it doesn't need to be connected to a server um and and so uh, uh, at the time other computer vision services like that required an internet connection so you had to take a photo upload the photo wait for several seconds or wait however long depending on your internet connection um, before you'd get a, a, a reading back. Um, we actually managed to create our app so that yeah, it could be done in real time on the phone and, and wouldn't require the use of an internet server. And so, um, yeah, at the time we launched, we could do three images per second um, and then seven. Uh, and so it means you could use our app in space or at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so, yeah, it's, 
uh, and, and, and hence, you know, we're able to apply our technology to uh, other industries who are interested in having that real time uh, internet, internetless uh, computer vision technology. Uh, great. So now we come to the second question is, um, so as you may know, AI is an emerging field in today's um, industry, in today's lifestyle as well. So what advice would you give to our generation of undergrad students to use AI in you know, transforming and helping out the world? And what is your take on that as well? Sure, yeah, there's a lot of opportunities with AI. Um, and so my advice is just, yeah, learn, learn as much as you can about the technology and um, just, you know, it can be really applied to any industry. So just learn about industries that you're interested in and, um, and yeah, there'll be solutions that you can apply to improve the efficiencies. Um, so really it's about, yeah, developing your interests, developing your strengths uh, and your skills and um, yeah, being curious and uh, yeah, so many opportunities every every industry uh great yeah i think that's a really good advice um so on the, another question we have is how long do you think uh tech for the disabled will be able to reach the general market um where one of the problems with um, this market is that affordability is an issue and as you innovate more and more, um, you know, obviously the price tag becomes, you know, higher and higher. So how do you think, what is a way you think that can combat that issue? Sure. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I've seen um, disability tech really improve and innovate over the, over the past several years. Um, for example, there's like many more um, things to help people with paraplegia walk, uh, like exoskeletons. I've seen a lot of innovation there. Um, and, and and I think that's pretty incredible because it, it, it kind of went from, um, it, it kind of went from like a, a zero to one where like there wasn't really anything out there and now there is. Um, and so like the first technologies when they came out cost like $150,000 and uh, which meant that insurance companies would have to cover that because it's, it's pretty expensive. But I mean, for, for that price, they were giving people the ability to walk. And as um, if the technology works and is useful, then people will find the money. They, they can fundraise through through charities or use their insurance and they'll be able to get that technology. And as more and more people use it, then um, the, the disability tech manufacturers are able to manufacture more. And um, and that that brings down the price over time. Um, again, like there's things like Spot and Spot Mini, um, you know, that didn't exist a few years ago um, and that was only commercialized this year. So, uh, so again, that's like a, a zero to one, it, it didn't exist. And so, um, and, and now it does. And um, even the, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, you went from not being able to afford it at all with all the money in the world. And now you can for, for like, I don't know, like 25, thousand dollars so um I, I think it just goes to show that like the price of these things is getting cheaper uh yeah it went from no money in the world could pay for it and now you can with tens of thousands of dollars and um and the price will continue to fall as people uh, uh people purchase it and um and yeah when people purchase these things it means that the companies can innovate and find ways to cut the price and find ways to make the technology available to more people. So um, I think, yeah, I think we are seeing a trend in, in, in this technology being more available to people. Great, thank you for answering the question. So the next question we have is, what or who do you think helped you the most to get uh, the word out about your, um, your inventions or your company as well? Sure. Um, so I guess like, I feel like RoboGals is like the best to to share about because I was um, I was very young then um, and I didn't know anyone and I didn't have any money like I had nothing. Um, I mean, I 
I just moved to a new city the year before that. Like I moved from this really tiny rural regional place uh, to this big city to go to university. And so no one knew me. I didn't know anyone. Um, and so, so that's why I think it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, it, it's a good example of, of something where you go from nothing to, to having something. Um, getting the word out was, you know, I, 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 the way that I saw it is that you just talk to everyone about it uh, and you keep talking to people about it um, and people will say no and people will say yes. And if someone says no, then you say thank you and, and then you move on to the next person. And so it's just, it's, it's really about playing the game and um, not getting hung up if someone doesn't talk to you or someone says no. It's just moving on, keep moving on. Um, it's that, yeah, it's just that persistence and, and hustle. Uh, so just, yeah, and, and volume, like just just keep standing on your soapbox and shouting out the message. Um, you know, I think like um, we, and, but I mean, at the same time, like you have to keep yeah putting in the work and, and standing on your soapbox and, and getting back on. Um, I, I, I like the quote that, uh, you know, people, people want to be inspired um, and so um, if, if you want to be inspired, do the work, because if you do the work, that's what gets the results. Um, so, yeah, you just have to keep thinking about creative ways to, to get the word out there. Um, and so, you know, initially um, getting, getting our student volunteers, because the head of the electrical engineering department was the one who suggested this project to me. I said, oh, hey, can you send this email out to all the uni students in your classes so that we can get some more people to join and so that's why we had 60 people who joined in the next in the first three weeks of the project um and then um the schools like I just wrote a list of all the girls schools in the area and I just called them and said hey can I speak to the um I, I'd say oh hey we want to come in you know we're from this university the best university in Australia can we come and run some robotics workshops for you girls and the receptionist would say, oh, yeah, that's our science coordinator. Or, yeah, that's the eight year, year eight math teacher. And so um, I kind of let the receptionist direct me to the best person to speak to in that school. Um, and I tried to always get a name for that per for that teacher. And so after I, I got the name, I kind of had an in. Then I could say, oh, hi, Mrs. White. Um, you know, this is what we're doing. And then I had someone to follow up with in the future as well. Um, uh, getting, getting sponsorship was was like more difficult. Um, I mean, again, I just emailed a whole bunch of people, um, uh, but then we wanted like more and larger amounts of sponsorship. We had to just like consistently show up and consistently work on building relationships with people. Like I remember uh, getting fun. Um, I, I remember I had to go to Google like, I don't know, like six times before they gave me money. But, you know, I always made sure I went at lunchtime. So I got free food, <laughs> which is good. Um, yeah, it was just like showing up all the time um, and being consistent and, um, and yeah, going to conferences. Yeah, I, I looked for conferences that were relevant to engineering. And um, I'd be like the youngest person there and I'd just go around and talk to everyone. Um, and I remember like this one conference I went to um, this guy I sat next to, he was like, oh, you should meet my, uh, like, our senior vice president. She really likes all this, you know, women in engineering stuff. And I was, like, really shy and nervous. Um, but then, like, he he beckoned me and he was like, oh, come come meet her. And so I met, you know, standing there and I told her, told her about us and I gave him my business card. Uh, I printed, like, 100 of them before the conference. And she said, oh, very interesting. I'll, I'll look at your website. And and then the next day, in the last session of the conference, she mentioned us like three or four times. So she she looked out in the audience and said, "Oh, and Robo Gals gets girls interested in engineering through robotics, and Robo Gals is located at all these universities and Robo Gals." And I was like sitting there, like, "Oh my God, she mentioned us at this conference." And then afterwards, because she mentioned us, everyone wanted to speak to me and. Um, and everyone kind of like swarmed me and, you know, I was, I was so thankful that she mentioned us. And, and I think, you know, the only reason she did is because I spoke to her, like one of the people in her team and 
and, and told him about us and um, he told her about us and um, and yeah so after, after she was on stage I spoke to her and I said hey we really need funding and she said oh well I'll send you an email I, I know some I know I have some I, I know some grants and so um, yeah I applied and and I remember like several months later we I received a letter saying that we were successful in receiving our funding and that was our first big piece of funding and and it would fund all of our activities for the next year um, and all the activities from the previous year and so I remember walking home that day and just feeling like oh my god like we we did it we we you know we, we have this funding to make us sustainable and we can really grow from here and be really creative and I just felt so satisfied so yeah just go out have those conversations and you never know what will happen yeah that's great so we have one pre-submitted question and that is what is one thing you wish you could tell your past self regarding your tech journey and any hardships yeah sorry um i think like when you're starting your first venture it's really uncertain like you don't know you don't know whether it's going to work or not and so it's definitely like that with robo gals like i didn't know it was gonna if it was gonna work or not all i knew was that i really enjoyed doing what i was doing and uh i think yeah, i really enjoyed working with my team and making things happen on a big scale um i mean we yeah we had hundreds and then thousands of volunteers around the world we're impacting hundreds and then thousands and then tens of thousands of people around the world um and we're all uni students and um you know we're all volunteers we weren't getting paid and I, I just found it so exhilarating to be in that community and to impact so many people and create so much change. And, um, and so that's what, that's what kept me going. It was like, oh, you know, we've built this, we've built this community and um, people want to grow and people want to develop themselves. And so I need to keep making this community better. I need to keep making this program better so that people want to be part of it i need to keep thinking of more ambitious goals and more ambitious projects so that people are inspired um and they'll be inspired if i'm inspired if i'm really excited about the things that we're working on and so i kept pushing forward to to make it better and better um so um yeah i think um sorry what was the question again <laughs> Okay, yeah, so the next question is, um, what do you have in mind for the next few years for um, uh, AI bot? What are your main goals and how do you plan to stand out? And what what do you think makes you guys um, unique compared to other companies? Sure, so our eight degree of freedom robot arm is really unique because our competitors cost about $300,000 and our robot costs three thousand dollars in parts and so we're like a hundred times cheaper and we managed to achieve that through being clever about the components that we used um so when i was designing our telepresence robot i i realized that um that with linear actuators you could achieve a lot more torque per dollar um and and um with a lot of robot arms they use harmonic drive gears which are really expensive um they're about uh like fifteen thousand dollars for these gears and i thought uh, and, and so they use these harmonic drive gears because they're they're little like little hockey pucks they're round and they're like that tall um and so you can just like put them in the arm joints and get it to move around um and um and yeah so what makes them expensive and why people use them is because they have a really small form factor um, and, and they're discreet. And so I thought, well, what I've heard from people with disabilities is that's, um, you know, that they, they do want, they, they do want everything. Um, but I noticed, you know, their chairs are humongous. Um, like I, I thought, well, if we could not have, um, the robot arm being discreet as one of the criteria, then we could bring down the cost significantly. Um, and so, with the G3 robotic arm that we designed, we optimize for costs. Um, we, we optimize for uh, torque or lifting capacity. Um, and 
Um, and so that's why this eight degree of freedom ribbon arm of ours is, is quite big. It's about that big. Um, it looks like this tall uh, and it can lift uh, over like 1.8 meters into the air um, and it can lift all the way down to the ground. Um, so it's got these two linear actuators as the body that lifts up the entire arm. Um, it's got, it's got um, omni wheels on the bottom for holonomic drive. So it can actually drive um, sideways like a crab and it can drive forwards and backwards. Um, and it can also rotate on the spot. Um, and, um, and then we use stepper motors with um, timing belts at the top in order for it to uh, lift as much as possible. So the other thing with robot arms is that the more motors that you put on the arm, um, the heavier the arm gets. And so it means that the motors at the bottom of the arm don't just have to lift whatever you're trying to pick up. They also have to lift all the motors along the way. And so, um, and so with our design, we use a timing belt so that we could put um, motors further back. Um, and so the arm doesn't have to lift the motors. It can just lift uh, the structure of the arm and whatever it's picking up. Uh, also with our design, uh, yeah, we try to keep all the mass as low and as central as possible. And so the mass of the motors actually acts as a counterweight to everything that the arm's trying to pick up. Uh, so anyway, we try to be innovative in all these different ways. And, and so it's meant that, yeah, we've been able to create this, this arm for a hundred times cheaper than our competitors. Um, and our arm can lift a lot. It can lift three and a half kilos from 80 centimeters away, uh, which is a lot. Like that's, um, that's like more than, uh, lifting up a, a, a half gallon of milk, basically. Um, and, and which was which is what people wanted. Um, they said, "Oh, you know, if we can, if we if we can lift like a half gallon of milk, that'd be great." And so we kind of had that as something we wanted to achieve. Um, and so being able to achieve that from eighty centimeters away is is actually um, really really good. Because uh, I mean, a lot of robot arms they, they might measure like what it can lift from like half that distance away. Um, they might be able to lift like three pounds from half that distance away. And so yeah, lifting seven pounds from um, 80 centimeters away is, is, is something we're proud of. Um, and so, yeah, we've, we've got this robot arm and, um, it actually, it actually weighs quite a bit. It weighs like 90 pounds. Um, and as we currently where we will, we'll, we'll uh, make it so that it's, um, we, we've made it so that like you can actually take the robot arm apart into three sections. So it's easier to lift and transport around. Um, and so each section, uh, and because it's, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's a bit heavy, but it's also like a weird form factor. So um, if you can take it apart into three pieces, it's, it's actually easier to carry and, um, and move because got, we've got like a limb dip and we've got the, uh, the tower in the middle with the linear actuators and then we've got the base. Because um, we found with our previous robots that we built that just, yeah, being able to carry it around and transport it around was really important to our customers. And so, yeah, we're really excited about all those different aspects of our robot arm. Uh, we actually showed our robot arm to the world for the first time in a documentary that we did earlier this year with Al Jazeera English. Um, so they filmed a 25-minute 25 doc documentary about my projects and, um, yeah, put it on their, on their news channel and, and, and showed the world our robot. Um, but we're actually preparing to launch our robot next year. So you'll be, you'll be able to see more videos and more images and more specs about our robot next year. Yep, very excited to, to see that. Um, so we have one more question and then we're gonna end it. So um, Shrey Tiagi, sorry if I'm saying your name wrong, but it's your story is really inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. I wanted to know how did you make a choice between the conventional job academics and compare that to starting your own venture for social good? Yeah, so I think I, um, <laughs> well, when I was going through high school, I didn't actually know whether I was going to be an engineer or whether I'd be a doctor because my mom thought that I should be a doctor. And, uh, you know, because I'm Asian. Um, and and uh, I remember I was in year 12 and I went to my medicine interview um, 
and they asked me all these questions about biology and then they said oh, and I wasn't very good at answering those questions about biology because I hadn't really done that much biology I was more like maths and physics um and then they said respond to the scenario uh John wants to study history but his parents want him to do law what should John do and so I like in that moment in that interview I kind of thought like what am I doing here like do they know that I'm a fake and so I said John should study history because that's what he's passionate about and then the meeting ended and as soon as I was outside I, I called my mom and I said I'm, I'm doing engineering and that's that and so I think like in that moment I kind of realized like oh I don't want to just follow the path like with medicine it's it's pretty well structured that you know in five years you're gonna do an internship somewhere and then in 10 years you're gonna you know do another internship and then and then another five years you're gonna specialize and get your specialization and I thought oh, I don't want to do that I don't know that life I want to not know what I'm going to do in 10 years I want to I want to you know be able to create my own path and it's it's scary but I found that you know it's actually it's 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 been worth it so, so far for me um so I guess like when I after thinking that when I got into university I thought being like starting my own business is something that I'm really interested in and something that I've been thinking about all through high school. I read Richard Branson's books, like Screw It, Just Do It. Um, and it, it all sounded really exciting to me. And so I thought I'm going to use my university years to find out what I'm really passionate about and create a job for myself, create a career for myself that I really enjoy. And and I thought, you know, I'm going to start a company and find out if I like doing that or, you know, maybe I don't like doing it. And then it will save me a lot of time and heartbreak in the future. And so, you know, at university, I started RoboGals and I got to learn how to lead a team and I got to learn how to make things happen in the world. I got to learn how to raise money. Uh, I got to, uh, you know, network and um, know people and be known. And I realized I loved it. I loved I loved it all. I, I loved working with people, making things happen, um, making things happen that didn't exist. Um, and I thought, I want to do this. I, I want to do this for the rest of my life. I want to keep making things happen and leading people. And, you know, but I want to build technology. And, and I don't really get to do that with Robo Gals. And so that's why I said, I'm, I'm going to go out and build technology. Um, and so, yeah, building, building iPoly, building Albot. Uh, it's meant I've had to learn how to recruit people, learn how to manage people, learn how to manage a technology project. Um, uh, learn how to build something and sell sell it to people. Um, yeah, uh, liaise with customers and you know offer them a product and offer them a service. Um, and so, you know, I think like that's why I think every every project you do, you learn more skills and you get better and you you just bring more skills into your into your skills bucket. Um, so that you can do bigger and more ambitious projects in the future. Um, and so I, I think like, um, you know, but I, I also know a lot of entrepreneurs. Um, I, I'm here in San Francisco now. And, and so a lot of my friends are entrepreneurs and, um, and, and, you know, some of them have exited and exited to Google or Facebook. And, and so they've been an entrepreneur for a few years and then they sell their company and, you know, now they're at Facebook for a few years and and then you know after that who, who knows so I think like it um you know you, you can plan your life how, however um uh you can plan to yeah start a company and then and then work at Big Corp and um and I, I know like for one of my friends um he he was like you know all of his friends were working at Google and Facebook and so he was like oh you know no, I wouldn't mind doing that for a few years and just learning from working at a bigger company and you know, having all those structures and having all those training programs and just um, you know yeah places like Google and Facebook they they hire for the best and and so um, and, and and so yeah you've got all these people you get to work with without having to raise the money and, and hire the people yourself um, and so they they really enjoy that um, but then you know I've had friends who who've been serial entrepreneurs and started three or four companies and and also worked at big corp so you know start a company they work at big corp start another company acquired by another big corp and then start another company because why not um 
and and I think like uh you know there's there's uh you know you've got one life and you've got so many years and um you just want to make that life as fun and interesting as possible and contribute to the world as much as possible during that time so um you can really design your life however you want and as long as you keep building your skills and keep doing things that interest you so that you bring energy and drive to what you're doing then there's opportunities everywhere and so yeah I mean I've lived in um Australia I've lived in the UK I I moved to San Francisco um I've um yeah I've I've traveled the world I've been to over 60 countries um I've yeah I it's just about creating the life that that you want um and and figuring out how you how you do it in a way that that keeps motivating you and and where you keep learning. Yeah, I completely agree with you. That is some very good insight. Um, So unfortunately that is, we are out of time and that is the end of the AMA. Um, uh, Thank you um, once again, uh, Ms. Shang for coming out here and um, spending your time with us here and answering all the questions. Um, We really had um, great insight as to um, your company, who you are, and of course, some great advice from you. Um, To all of our viewers, the Gail McDowell author of Cracking the Code interview and AMA is starting at 10 a.m. PSD, so check out our YouTube channel um, for the link to that as well, so you guys can watch that as well. Um, Once again, thank you, Ms. Chang. Thanks, thanks, Siddharth. It was really, really fun to hang out with you all. Um, Yeah, let me know if you have any more questions. Uh, My email address is hello at maridacheng.com so hello at maridacheng.com and you can find it at maridacheng.com and good luck with your hackathon and hope you guys create cool things and um yeah keep keep doing cool stuff and you're already off to a good start cheers